Our next speaker is Andrew Reeves. Andrew is an award-winning environmental writer and the author of Overrun, Dispatches from the Asian Carp Crisis, The Definitive History of the Invasive Species in North America. His writing on everything from algal blooms in Lake Erie to fights over mining rights on indigenous land in northern Ontario has appeared in numerous publications across Canada and the United States. Andrew holds a Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction from the University of, University of King's College and has been the recipient of numerous fellowships including the BAMP Center, the Toronto Public Library, and the Institute for Journalism and Natural Resources. In December 2019, Overrun was long listed for the RBC Charles Taylor Prize, Canada's highest award for nonfiction books. Andrew? put this can people hear me okay perfect I might put this in my pocket I have a tendency to move around when I talk otherwise if I'm just sort of tethered to one place and something who knows what would happen um, hi everyone uh, my name is Andrew Reeves thank you all so much for inviting me to come and speak with your organization today I, I really appreciate it um, so let's just make sure that I've got this taken care of all right this is me um, and this is Asian carp uh, my fear when I was invited was that I was going to be talking about something that was so like trodden ground at this stage. Like, I was like, oh, okay, if we're talking about waterways, if we're talking about the Great Lakes, I was like, yeah, we're going to talk about Asian carp again. Of course. If we're talking about invasive species, well, yeah, okay, but let's, let's hear your spiel about Asian carp. <laughs> and so what I was thinking about, like, what it is that I would want to talk to you all about, because, you know, writing a 360-odd page book, there's, there's a lot of material in here, there's a lot of directions that a story could go. Um, but I said, chances are if people are familiar with Asian carp, it's likely because they've seen something like this. <coughs> and so these are silver carp. Um, they're the only ones that leap, just to make sure that everyone knows. Um, and the amazing thing is, is that it's because of, of their ability to leap from the water like this that really we, we know as much about them as we do. They are fodder in a lot of ways for TV news because visually it's, it's very impressive to see. Um, so part of the reason why I started writing this book was because I looked around and I saw that there were a few, new, you know, a few magazine articles that had been written about them, so a lot of online news, a lot of TV news because of, of their you know, charisma and this jumping capability that they have. Um, but when I looked around to see, has someone written a book about this? And I realized that uh, no one had. So when I started writing this in 2014, I spent about four years writing it in just perpetual fear that at any day someone was going to get in touch with me and say, actually, someone else is writing about this. Um, are people familiar with, with Dan Egan's book, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes? I, it's a silly question, I imagine, for this crowd. Um, that was my big fear. Uh, so in Dan's book, he has one chapter on Asian carp, but I was worried that there was going to be so much overlap potentially uh, that it would take away from what it is that I was trying to tell. And so when his book came out, I ran and got myself a copy and I read through it and I was very, very relieved to see that, okay, for him it was one chapter, which I've explored into a whole book. Fascinatingly though, when I was on tour for this book in Minneapolis, Minnesota, there was a man in the audience who came over and introduced himself afterwards and basically said the same thing in reverse. He's also writing a book about Asian carp and when he found that Overrun was coming out, he was absolutely terrified and he had his publisher fax him, a, or, or no, not fax, who faxes? <laughs> Sorry, didn't like mail him a copy of the book as soon as it came out and he poured over it and thankfully got to the end and had this like, ah, okay. There's enough air between them, enough distance that they actually will read pretty well as companions as opposed to competitors, which I was very relieved about. So, I always want to make sure that everyone is singing from the same hymn sheet whenever we get started on a talk like this. So, what exactly are Asian carp? First and foremost, a lot of news stories don't tend to differentiate. So I wanted to make sure that everyone knows that when we use the term, 
Asian carp, it is this umbrella term, and that we are actually talking about four separate species, big head, silver, grass, and black carp. Um, the native range, northern China, uh, parts of Russia as well, um, introduced to North America, 63, 72, 84-ish. It's also really important to know that they eat very different things, but it's the combination of the four of them together that actually makes them potentially as lethal as they could be, because they all focus on different areas of the aquatic food chain. Size and weight, as I mentioned, they grow up to 140 pounds. I had the pleasure of holding about a 50 pound big head carp when it was handed to me. Um, I had to make sure that I like bent my knees, it was like, it was like, like, like brace my back, it was like use two hands to grab it under the gills because they are, they are large. And that fish that I, that I picked up that I thought was just astronomically huge is about average. That's 40 pounds, 40, 50 pounds, that's, that's about right. If we go back a second, it was like these ones here, that big one right there in the middle Maybe the one right below it, they're probably about 28, 29, maybe 30 pounds. So those are on the smaller side. So interesting, when we're talking about range, uh, we have the Gulf Coast all the way up the Great Lakes along the Mississippi River and the Atlantic Coast. From their introduction in Arkansas, they've basically used, as we expected they would, the waterways of the continent in order to be able to spread. So from Arkansas, they have headed on their own, and this isn't even with our help, it was like south to the Gulf of Mexico, where they've shown an astonishing tolerance for salt water that no one saw coming, and all the way north to Mississippi, and, or to uh, Minnesota, I should say, and the Great Lakes. Now, because they've gone about as far as they can go north and south, the interesting leading point of the invasion right now, and if you have a Google alert set for Asian carp, as I still do, the vast majority of stories about Asian carp where do you think that they would be coming from? What states do you imagine would be the most concerned about Asian carp at this stage? Missouri and Oklahoma. Not quite. Missouri, Missouri is, sorry, I should say, Missouri is one of them as they're making their way further up the Missouri River. It's actually Kentucky and Tennessee because they are using the Ohio and the Cumberland Rivers to be able to get into like um, land of land between the lakes, land of lakes, national park or national <laughs> recreation area there. Um, I did not appreciate just how many people in Kentucky own boats, uh, but basically they are, I, so I learned something in this research process, many things, uh, but that was one of them. And so the interesting thing is, having gone as far north and south as they can go, we're now seeing the fish are spreading east and west. And so this is why you have states like Missouri and, Ark and, or sorry, and uh, Tennessee and Kentucky uh, that are actually writing more about this and focusing more on it than many other states in the country. This is grass carp in particular, but this is just to give you some idea of where we find them. In some cases, this is spread that has happened uh, organically without our assistance, where you see them in the Pacific Northwest, parts of California and parts of Florida, uh, that is where we have moved them to. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. Um, because we're, I was chatting with some people about this yesterday. Um, while the story that we often hear about how Asian carp came to America uh, isn't, isn't a lie, because I think that would imply malice, and I don't believe that that's the case. It is, it is a dangerously thin history. And that was really one of the impetuses for me for writing this book. Um, a couple years ago, when the Army Corps of Engineers proposed spending $18 billion to hydrologically separate the Great Lakes from the Mississippi Basin in Canada, where we don't really have an equivalent of the Army Corps, I remember thinking, this is an outrageously huge number and over two and a half decades. And, and normally, when we talk about big projects like this, we're talking about securing water supplies or food for large populations. And in this case, it was about stopping a fish. And I thought, that's bizarre. And so the more I looked into it, the more I realized that, okay, there's, there's a really rich story here that hasn't really been told in the way that I, I thought maybe it deserved. So my first foray into this was traveling to Cleveland in January of 2014 uh, for an Army Corps engineer. Uh, they were holding a public town hall on the Great Lakes Mississippi River Interbasin study plan that they were doing. And I approached the Asian carp czar, uh, John Goss, um, afterwards, and I asked him, I was like, you know, Mr. Goss, so I'm coming here from Canada. D does Canada have a, a moral obligation in some way, sharing these waterways with the United States to, to help pay for this? And he's a consummate bureaucrat, so I got a very sort of bureaucratic response to this. And then there was a pause, and, he, and, and at the end, he basically said, I said, I don't know 
<laughs> what it would look like, but we would sure appreciate some help from Canada. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized sort of how silly it was for us to be content on the north side of the border uh, while the Great Lakes states uh, were pulling their weight and then some was like paying the lion's share of the money to be able to, to stop this fish. And so I thought if Americans are going to be asked to spend $18 billion potentially, but even if that pl plan doesn't come through, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars every year through the Great Lakes uh, Restoration Initiative on this and other issues. We should know more definitively about how they got here because this, this current story, which in a nutshell is that ignorant fish farmers in the 1990s brought these fish in and then there was flooding and they escaped and whoops. And I'm, I'm being glib, obviously, but that's, that's not too far off what it is that we've told ourselves. A lot of news stories, if they bother giving any history about how Asian carp got here, that's, that's the nitty gritty of it really is it was fish farmers, they didn't care flooding, and now it's too late. But the truth, as I say here on the bottom, is, is incredibly uh, fascinating, and much more fascinating than this glib version that we've been telling ourselves for a while. So the story of how Asian carp arrived here actually has a, a, a bit of an unlikely source. And it's Rachel Carson. And for, I'll give you your, your Coles Notes version of Silent Spring for those who aren't familiar, though I imagine you all are. Uh, she was one of the first people to really hammer home this idea, which seems brutally obvious, which is that we are part of the natural world and the natural world is part of us. And that the idea of being able to indiscriminately spray chemical pesticides without any concern for the natural world, let alone our own health and safety, it was remarkably silly. But this was the time. This was better living, better living through chemistry. My mother-in-law told me a story growing up in Amherst, Nova Scotia, of how her brother, her older brother and his friends would hop on their bikes when the DDT truck was r running down Main Street so that they could ride their bikes through the cloud because it was fun. And then here they are at a pool somewhere in, I'm going to guess, maybe late 1950s, early 1960s, just dousing children. <laughs> but of course this was the natural end result and it could only ever be this way was that we saw these chemical poisons slowly start to move their way up the food chain with the end result being that like top predators like American bald eagles were dying but they weren't the only ones but the amazing thing is the story then really takes off with this man Jim Malone Jim Malone, that's his father over here on the left-hand side in this photograph. His father purchased this property in Arkansas, in Lone Oak County, in the 1950s with the idea that he was going to build a fee fishing lake, which I had never really heard of, but were very popular still in the south where you'd keep and stock this pond and people would come and pay to fish. And so he got the man over here on the right, it was like he got his son, Jim Malone, over here on the left. He got him involved in the, the family business. And it took off in fits and starts. And then Jim, or Jim Malone here in Arkansas turned to, to rice production, like later on in his life. And these are some pictures that I found from the archives. It was like of what their property looks like, just to give you an idea when they're talking about building these sorts of ponds. I also want to show you just eventually how deeply Jim Malone got involved in this process. But before I do, I want to show you this packing slip here. As a researcher, this is one of the amazing things that you will sometimes find in the archives because Jim Malone has 16 boxes of material at the University of Central Arkansas that I had the pleasure of sifting through over a few days when I was there. And I found this, which is the first private shipment of silver and big head carp into America. Um, they arrived on Flying Tiger Airlines on August 22nd of 1972. But I want to take a step back for a moment. Rachel Carson comes into play in this very dramatic way because one of the key things that she had suggested was that this idea of biological control was going to be much more useful to be able to control uh, natural predators than this indiscriminate spraying of chemical pesticides. 
And I had scheduled to do a really, really quick reading later on in the presentation, but then this morning when I decided what it was that I wanted to read to you, um, I actually think that it ties in really well here. So I'm going to stop and briefly give you a sense of, of the book and how it is that Rachel Carson ties in before I move on. Um, so this takes place in Arkansas, uh, where I'm meeting with a man named Mike Freeze, um, who used to work with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and is now a private fish um, producer in Lone Oak uh, County, Arkansas. And this also calls back to a meeting that I had with a man named Drew Mitchell, who used to work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, who was one of the first people to work on uh, producing uh, sterile grass carp in the 1980s. As our meeting concluded, Mike Freeze handed me a water-stained banker's box overflowing with musty fish reports, files, and photos dating back to the 1960s. That night, I dissected the documents, flicking away the exoskeletons of long, dead beetles trapped between Arkansas Game and Fish Commission reports. Suddenly, it occurred to me why talk of Rachel Carson, Carson had stuck in my throat. Freeze wasn't the first to invoke Silent Spring. Drew Mitchell had told me much the same. I reviewed my interview notes. Mitchell. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, there was tremendous chemical usage, DDT being the poster child. And then there became many scares in the public, and people became very concerned about it biologically. A book arose from this that's really a trendsetter, a wonderfully written book by Rachel Carson. She suggests the use of biological control to get away from chemical controls, even the importation of biological controls, whatever we can do to lower chemical usage. This was a huge trend. Her book came out in 1962. And in 1963, grass carp was first brought in by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Me. So wait, was this actually a driving force behind their decision? Mitchell. Absolutely. Because some people say, well, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was really screwed up. But no. They were following what they thought was good, appropriate, sound advice. Concern over chemicals so far outweighed it that they didn't worry about it. Fish and Wildlife were dealing with, how do we lower chemical use? And these grass carp, they gave them something. The impact of Silent Spring in creating a social, um, social mindset where importing an exotic fish for biological control of aquatic weeds seemed rational is often overlooked in Asian Carp's American Odyssey. Despite its current iteration as a harbinger of ecological doom, invasive carp fits snugly into an environmental ethos that evolved throughout the 1960s, turning a blind eye to the high cost of prolonged chemical use, both economic and environmental, became increasingly arduous after Carson exposed the chemical industrial complex's dark underbelly. Using grass carp was a compelling new course of action. As Mitchell told me, these grass carp, they gave them something. And so the interesting thing was, was that in the early 1963, Fish and Wildlife Service had a meeting, and they invited the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, but they also invited a representative from the United Nations who was an aquaculture and fisheries expert. And this meeting took place in Arkansas, and again around 1963, and the recommendation that came all the way from the United Nations, these weren't, remember, the ignorant fish farmers narrative, this came from the United Nations, who made a recommendation suggesting, actually, in China, there is this miracle fish called grass carp, and it can eat aquatic weeds better than anything you can possibly imagine. You should import them and see whether they would be able to solve your, your weed problem that you're encountering, because that they would be a perfect biological control. The one caveat that was mentioned from the man from the UN was, take your time though, don't rush. Think this through and figure out what impacts, if any, you think this fish could have here in natural waterways before you import them. How long do you think they waited? <laughs> About a month. And within a month, the decision was made to green light these fish, it was like, which were then slowly, which were gradually then imported into the country. But I have a, a six degrees of separation comparison here in the book as well, just so that we're abundantly clear. This, this wasn't America as an outlier in importing this. Grass carp were hugely popular in the early 1960s. And with China as the world's largest producer at the time, they were shipping these fish every, to every corner of the world. And then because we're talking about this Cold War ethos at the time, the world even sort of divided into two blocks. So you had America receiving and then sending these fish out was like to uh, countries that were in the American sphere of interest, like West Germany, for example. But then you had the Soviet bloc, where they were then sending these fish was like to countries that were within the Soviet bloc as well. Grass carp were everywhere. <laughs> 
And what ended up happening here in the United States was that there was this strange uh, arms race almost between Auburn University and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that was operating in Arkansas to see who could produce more of these fish. So all of the early age stages of this, when we could have been researching what impact they might have had in the natural ecosystems here, we didn't bother. What were we concerned about? How fast can we possibly produce these fish? Because we know that industry is going to want them as soon as they possibly can. We're talking about um, uh, people who are running large-scale farms. They wanted these fish for, irriga for irrigation canal control. Golf courses wanted them to stock them in ponds to keep their ponds clear. Uh, municipalities that were running um, hydroelectric plants wanted to keep the fish stocked to be able to make sure that weeds weren't gucking up the intake pipes that they needed for cooling purposes. There was a perceived demand, and in those early years, the question was, can we produce these fish as fast as we conceivably can? And it turns out we got really good at it. So good, in fact, it was like that by the early 1970s, Auburn University had produced 100,000 viable grass carp fry in one go and had no idea what to do with these fish. What do you do with 100,000 fish? It's like, well, turns out, according to the research that I, I did and the articles I found, they gave a lot of them away. The literature used the term persons unknown received uh, the, the lion's share of these 100,000 fish. So picture this, what, what do we mean when we say persons unknown? We mean locals in Arkansas and Alabama, parts of Mississippi, who came in and were handed an invasive fish by one of the country's leading institutions to go back and stock and do whatever they wanted with. And so Jim Malone becomes one of the first private players to really get into this field. And it starts with his father building this fee fishing lake, which goes bust. He then starts planting rice on his property to try and grow rice, but there's federal changes in rice acreage regulations, which I won't go into. He can't grow rice anymore. And so what he does is he hears wind of these fish, silver and big head carp, which, are in which were uh, being grown in China. And he brings them over here, and he dedicates a small portion of his rice acreage to these small ponds on his property to be able just to sort of hedge his bets, basically. If the rice doesn't take off, maybe these fish will. And so this is the packing slip, where he orders the first fish that come through. Eventually, I found these two photos, which I just wanted to throw in. They become so big in this small field of aquaculture that here is a photo of his wife, um, uh, who is attending. The, they also called grass carp white ammer, um, ecology's helper. So here they were taking it to different conferences around the country. And this was a photo that I had to include because it's amazing. It's his wife, Doretta, with Bob Hope. <laughs> they traveled to California to be able to see how their fish were doing in an agriculture irrigation pond. And, while they were, and then while they were there, they also stopped in to see how the fish were doing at a local golf course. And it just so happened that Bob Hope was nearby. And so she had this photo taken, and it ended up in the local newspaper in Arkansas as an example, basically, of like locals done good. So. <laughs> I, I include something like this because I don't think sometimes people believe me given how reviled uh, Asian carp are now, just how popular they were then. They were really, especially grass carp in the beginning, was really viewed as this potential lifesaver. But slowly, it began to change because people started asking the logical questions, which is if they make it into the natural waterways, which we kind of already suspect that they have, what impact will they have? So then all of a sudden you started seeing articles like this, these, these back and forths between like, I'm opposed to grass carp, and then people who would write in and say, yeah, controversial biological control. This appeared a little bit later in the 1990s, but we were still talking about it then. Is grass carp, is this, are they a curse? Or are they this cure-all? But taking a step back, everything sort of changed in 1972 after the Clean Water Act became law. As I say, in a nutshell, I've always summarized the impact of the Clean Water Act as follows, that it codified into law the blindingly obvious fact that dumping raw sewage into whatever hapless local waterway that happened to be nearby was a remarkably dumb idea. But it turns out, in this often unexplored way, that the Clean Water Act also had a tremendous impact on the future of Asian carp in North America, and not for the best. So, this man, Homer Buck, can people see what it is that he's standing near? What it is that's behind him? 
pigs. So, why is he standing near this pen of pigs, and why is this pen of pigs kind of built on the precipice of a, of a waterway? Well, Homer Buck and Jim Malone, the man I showed you earlier, they, they quickly developed a bit of a correspondence as two of the leading thinkers who were working on this issue at the time. And it was around the time in the 1960s, 70s, into the early 80s that catfish farming had really taken off. In 20 years, catfish farming uh, had about 6,000 people in those three states uh, that were employed in this field. It was about an $8.4 billion industry, like pretty early on. But the problem was, Catfish need to eat a very like, high protein feed um, that often resulted in like, a lot of poop and a lot of algal blooms that were uh, growing in the tanks that they were kept in. And so the solution for a really long time had been to try and like, strain them out or dump chemicals in. But then after uh, the Clean Water Act came out and after Rachel Carson's book came out, the idea of treating these ponds by just dumping in chemicals uh, seemed you know, pretty abhorrent. And so Homer Buck had this amazing idea, which is, can we see whether fish that are reared in this pond can grow eating nothing but hog manure and sunshine, he called it. <laughs> and so he started one of these early tests. Um, so that's why this hog pen is sort of built out over top of the water, um, because he found that the catfish in a lot of ways, was like, and grass carp for that matter, were able to eat basically just pig manure. Um, and that it actually it didn't really do much to change the composition of the fish in terms of how healthy they were. Um, and it was a lot cheaper than the high-protein feed. So the idea behind it was let's introduce big head and grass carp. Remember, I mentioned them earlier. Simply because it was like unlike uh, grass carp, which was eating plants, you had silver and uh, big head carp that were uh, aquatic weeds. You had silver and big head carp that were filter feeders that were going to be able to swim through a waterway and basically just suck in debris, phytoplankton, zooplankton, that algae, anything at all. And so the idea was, let's put them in the catfish ponds with these catfish. They'll clean it up better than the chemicals will. We can do this plan that Homer Buck came up where we can feed them hog manure. It's going to be amazing. Our costs will go down. It'll be more environmentally friendly. This is what could go wrong. <laughs> well. I mean, I'm here for a reason, obviously something did go wrong. Um, the fascinating thing was is that this initial idea of bringing them here for catfish farming quickly went belly up uh, for the simple fact that Asian carp, especially big head and silvers, they grow substantially larger than catfish. And like most fish, when you're attempting to haul them out of the water, they don't want to come without a fight. And so catfish farmers really quickly found that when they were pulling the nets in um, or like draining the ponds in order to be able to get the catfish out that they wanted, that the big head and silver carp were growing so much larger that two things were happening. They were injuring the workers who were trying to haul the catfish out, and they were growing so large that they were actually beating and thrashing the catfish to death. And so very quickly the catfish industry said, thanks but no thanks. We, we are not interested in working with these fish. So then we had to find something else to do with them because we had already imported them, we had, we had spawned them, we had gotten good at it. Jim Malone was like, had brought those fish over from Taiwan. He was growing them on his property. He wanted a market for them because he had been told there's going to be a market for this. So this is where the Clean Water Act comes in. One of the stipulations of the Clean Water Act was that basically just dumping raw sewage into local waterways, we couldn't do that anymore. Big cities that were doing this, they had the tax base though to be able to build big new filtration plants. But smaller communities, small counties, they couldn't afford it. So one of the recommendations that came through at this time from the Environmental Protection Agency was, you know, there's these fish, <laughs> big head and silver carp, and they are amazing filter feeders that can swim through the water. They will gobble up, it was like through anaerobic digestion, like all of the, the solids that are in sewage lagoons. Maybe we can stock sewage lagoons with big head and silver carp and they will, do, and they will uh, make sure that the water that is being released actually meets um, EPA guidelines. And so the task fell to one man, Scott Henderson, who I was so happy that I had the opportunity to speak with for the book. He was, the, he was a rookie fisheries biologist with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission at the time, and he was given the responsibility to take big head and silver carp and put them in a sewage lagoon and see whether it would work. So he found a hospital in Benton, Arkansas, that had uh, two sewage lagoons to treat the waste of about 2,100 people. And he stocked them with big head and silver carp, and he set off to, on his experiment over a number of years to see what would happen. 
But he also did something else. He did some back of the napkin math and realized that people eat these fish in China, right? And if we're growing them here in these sewage lagoons, they're going to reach a point where, like, you know, they're so big and we would want to cycle them out with smaller fish so that they can grow. But what are we going to do with all those fish when they get too big to stay in the lagoons? Well, you see where I'm going with this. He contacted the National Sport Fisheries Bureau and got $18,000 to do a side test to see these fish that re are reared in the lagoons, can we eat them? Are they too poison, polluted at that point? Would anyone want to? Could we eat them and not get sick? And so I found these in the archives. It was like these are uh, reports from the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, annual reports from 1977 and 78, outlying the, the, the Chinese carp project and some of the money that he got to be able to do these tests. I'll fast forward a few years. He ran his tests, and lo and behold, he found two really positive, really remarkable things. These fish, as advertised, were incredible at cleaning those sewage lagoons. They ate everything that they possibly could. It was again, it meant that the water that was coming out of the lagoons met the EPA guidelines as, as advertised. He also found, surprisingly, it was like for a filter feeder, that the fish actually were surprisingly low in the kinds of contaminants that you might expect. They were good to eat. He also found that if these counties that were stocking them could sell the fish for human consumption, they could actually make money on it. So it could become this strange sort of money-making venture for small communities. But what happened? Well, Ronald Reagan was elected. And he came in with a very different idea of what the EPA should do and the kinds of guidelines that they should have and the size of their budget. And so he appointed someone to lead the EPA, Ann Gorsuch, who's the mother of your new Supreme Court Justice, Neil Gorsuch, um, who famously bragged about like shrinking the book of EPA regulations from six inches down to one. And Reagan, meanwhile, shrunk the budget of the EPA it was like by about 50%. So going back a second, you have Scott Henderson here. He writes up his findings, those positive findings, after his years and years and years of doing this research. He mails it off to Washington and he waits. And he waits and waits and waits and waits for someone to get back to him, but no one does. So he calls his contact at the EPA and says, um, what's, what's going on? And they write back and say, there has been a political change, as you are well aware. Um, there will be no more funding for your project. Please wrap up all of your work immediately and thank you for your time. And he's gobsmacked. I talked to him a couple years ago, but this is decades and decades and decades later, and he still seems sort of wistful about it, sad that it, it, it hadn't worked out the way he thought it would, given how promising it was. So he went back and he drained the sewage lagoons. He had thousands and thousands of these fish that when I asked him what he did with them, he tells me that they were basically put into a dumpster uh, and allowed to rot on the shore. But here's the thing. Scott Henderson was diligent in removing all of the fish that he was experimenting with. But you remember I mentioned there were lots of fish that were out there at this point because people had been told that these fish are miracle workers. You remember grass carp and his Superman crest and cape. People have been told for decades at this point these are miracle fish and no matter what your problem is they will be able to deal with it. So while Scott Henderson was diligent in making sure that he destroyed the fish that were in his uh, care, not everyone was. So suddenly you have private players and universities for that matter and organizations like Fish and Wildlife Service who knew after that de decree sort of came down from the EPA and from Reagan that there was no more future for these fish in America. Well, what do you do with it? You have, this you have these fish that you've invested in, but now they're just taking up space. Now they're just costing you money. So what do you do with them? Well, you open up your sluice gate and you drain your pond. And wherever the fish go, you don't know. Maybe you don't want to know. Well, where did they go? In Arkansas, they went into local bayous that, as water does, flowed into larger streams, which flowed into larger rivers, which made their way to the Mississippi. And Mike Fries, that man whose office I was in at the start when I did the reading, he was responsible for working on the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission reports early on where he was detailing fish that were being reported at different commercial landings in Arkansas. And as I look through these reports over the late 1970s and early 1980s, you would see a number of native fish, but there was no mention of Asian carp. And then around 1978, there was the first mention of silver carp. 
but there was only maybe two or three that were reported caught. And then into the 1979, 80, 81, 82, suddenly you watch the numbers on these charts just shift. And you saw big head silver grass carp, which had historically been either not reported or reported in very low numbers, just skyrocket. And now they were the, uh, overwhel they were, they were the abundant fish that fishermen were hauling in. From the White River in Arkansas, they had access to the Mississippi. And from the Mississippi, they had access effectively to the rest of the continent. So, why are we worried about Asian carp? In a nutshell, how big they grow, which I talked about earlier, how often they spawn much more quickly, perhaps several times a year, uh, much more quickly than um, some native fish might, how quickly they spread, impacts on native species in the Great Lakes. Uh, as John mentioned earlier with these new reports, we have gone through every iteration of, well, maybe, maybe, maybe they won't survive in the Great Lakes. Well, maybe it's too cold. It's not. Maybe they won't find rivers that are long enough to spawn. They, they will. Maybe there wouldn't be enough food for them. Big head and silver carp can effectively just eat the aquatic equivalent of garbage. They, they will pivot to eat debris and detritus if they need to. Native fish can't do that. They evolved here to eat one specific thing. Destruction of wetlands is another key worry. Um, when grass carp uh, reach numbers that are unsustainable for the local food, there are anecdotal stories of grass carp when they basically denude a wetland, um, actually jumping out of the water to grab at shoreline plants and then hauling the shoreline plants back into the water in order to be able to have enough to eat. If you're starving, you do a lot of things in order to survive, and these fish are no exception. So this, uh, this, I believe, comes from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. It's a bit of a heat map that sort of shows if there is a large-scale introduction of uh, Asian carp, any of them, really, uh, because they all have the same sort of tolerance. This is year one, uh, and this is year 20. What protects Lake Superior is largely just like being the headwaters, is the way that the water is flowing. It's harder for them to get there. Uh, what protects Lake Ontario, or so it would seem, uh, is, is actually Niagara Falls and a lot of the turbines that are there. Um, there's not much reason to suspect that the fish would be able to, uh, to survive a plunge over the falls. That said, in 2015, the Toronto Region Conservation Authority responded to a dozen grass carp that were found uh, around the Toronto Islands. How did those dozen fish get there? We don't know. But there have also been catches of these fish that have been found in the Grand River and other tributaries of Lake Ontario. So this is assuming that we don't do anything silly and move them over unknowingly, but we have a history of doing silly things, either intentionally or otherwise. So I always provide a grain of salt, especially for anyone that is on Lake Ontario or the St. Lawrence River. This, I was like, well, you know, in 20 years, like, we're still doing okay. <laughs> like, we're not Green Bay, Wisconsin, but, you know, we're, we're doing all right, it, it, except um, it's predicated on a very large assumption, which is that we're correct in assuming that the fish couldn't survive a plunge over the falls, or that we're correct in assuming that we know enough about Asian carp that we would never willingly, uh, intentionally or otherwise, bring them into the lake. I don't know that any of us in this room would want to necessarily uh, base policy on the hope that people aren't going to move a species somewhere where it shouldn't be. It's a pretty shaky foundation. Um, finally, just to sort of give people a sense of what went into this, um, we have, uh, so again, I, I come from a background of journalism. It was about five years of research and writing. I was in 12 states and provinces, eight dozen interviews. I was in archives, newspapers, academic materials. I was, interview locations for something like this was actually uh, pretty remarkable for me. I, I interviewed people in canoes and marshes in the pouring rain. I was in fish processing plants where the smell of liquefied fish was so extreme that I actually had to back my way out of the plant because I thought that I was going to throw up on my interview subject. Um, I was in laboratories. We were in bars, cafes, restaurants. Uh, here I am at the eDNA lab at um, the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, um, Indiana. Here I am at Mike Freeze's plant in Lowen Oak, Arkansas. These are the fish, these are called the runways that the fish are kept in. There is now, a, I don't have time to go into it, there is now a thriving um, industry for sterile grass carp called triploid fish. 
and Mike Fries is one of the largest producers of these triploid fish, they're still remarkable at eating aquatic weeds and golf course managers still want to stock them in their ponds. The workaround was that we only stock fish who are incapable of reproducing and they are now certified by US Fish and Wildlife Service. And so these are the kinds of ponds that they're kept in. Uh, here are what their eggs look like um, after they have been dyed or stained with um, iodine. That's what gives them this pink color. Uh, but here they are in these McDonald hatching jars as part of the process of taking eggs and milt from the fish when they're in these kinds of runways uh, and mixing them together and bef uh, as, as they're part of their spawning process. That's a hunk of smoked silver carp um, that came from Thompson, Illinois on the border with Iowa on the Mississippi River that I ate. Um, you can eat it. I've eaten it a lot of different ways. I don't tend to talk about eating it because it's well-trodden ground. Um, but at the end of the day, people use this in spaghetti bolognese. They use it, they will eat it smoked. I've had it deep fried and breaded. You name it, you can do it with this. It basically tastes like a, a standard white fish. Whatever you want it to, it will taste like that. Although when I tell people that you can use it as a substitute in spaghetti bolognese, the reaction is usually like, Ugh, but do I have to? Um, Smoked was actually my least favorite way of consuming it, largely because it's a, it's, a, it's a flesh that will just take to whatever taste. So if you're just smoking it, it just tastes like smoke. Um, the reason why more people aren't able to eat it or don't want to eat it beyond the stigma is that in addition to it being very bony, it's the fact that it has this lattice structure of its bones, which means it's almost impossible to be able to remove them all. I've had it about four or five different ways, and overwhelmingly people have always told me, um, I assure you, I promise, you're not going to find any bones this way, and I always have. Um, this is a, a set of black carp uh, jaws. Um, that's to give you an idea of how big those fish can get. Is, you know, there's my thumb for, for measure. Uh, those are how big their molars get. Uh, and this is my arm uh, to give you a sense of how covered in fish blood and guts and slime I was after spending a day on the Ottawa River, or on the, uh, the Illinois River uh, near Ottawa, Illinois. Um, I had to throw out a hat and a jacket after that because the smell does not, does not come out. All right, that, so I'm gonna, so I did my reading already. Um, I'm gonna really, really quickly touch on this before I would open it up, some perhaps unexpected conclusions. The climate crisis, watershed degradation, big agriculture, urban sprawl. What do they have to do with Asian carp? And the answer is, is a lot. And in a nutshell, I'll, I'll break it down. We know that the, the climate crisis is uh, having impacts on weather, very different things, but it's having that impact on weather. In the Great Lakes Basin and across the Midwest, one of the ways in which that's manifesting itself is in more extreme rainfall events, where some, ooh, sorry, some places are, going, are getting 40% um, uh, of their annual rain in like two or three days. And what impact does that have? Well, when you have this kind of rainfall that's coming in these extreme ways, but we've also degraded a lot of our waterways so that they're actually, they're shorter, they're faster. We've removed the wetlands. They don't meander anymore because we found that inconvenient. So we've channelized them and made them ruler straight. And then you have these massive deluges. And so what happens? Well, where is that water falling? Well, if it's falling on a lot of farmland, uh, in one case, we have a major problem with legacy phosphorus um, here in Canada and in the United States as well. And so you, this major rain is disturbing the topsoil. You have a huge amounts of phosphorus and nitrogen that are now effectively making their way into a lot of these uh, waterways. Or if you have water that's falling in urban landscapes, which ha really has no permeable surfaces anymore, um, you have combined sewer overflows, which are taking essentially this rainwater mixed with untreated human sewage and dumping it into local waterways. So what does this all have to do with Asian carp? You have those major uh, rain events which speed up uh, water. Asian carp take these fast moving water events as a spawning cue. It's the way that they are able to make sure that their eggs are going to stay buoyant long enough in the water. And so they wait for big rain events for spawning cues. Also, what is all of that phosphorus and that untreated waste that's ending up in the water? What impact does that have? It creates a lot of food. I had described to me as basically like a, a buffet for Asian carp. And so if we don't find an effective way to curtail the climate crisis, which is rapidly spiraling beyond our control, if we don't think about ways of doing what Barbara was talking about earlier with improving like shorelines and waterways, bringing back wetlands, if we don't think about ways in which uh, agriculture can keep a lot of that phosphorus on its, its, in the soil where it belongs, where it's useful, and if we don't think about ways of implementing more green infrastructure, 
we are never going to actually effectively be able to get a control uh, of the Asian carp situation. Thank you very much. We don't have any time for questions right now, but Andrew is going to be available for book signing out there. I highly recommend his book. It is excellent and very informative. He'll also be available out there for questions. Absolutely, yeah. Answers, and so uh, please talk to him. I, I, I tend to run on, sorry about that. That's <laughs> You did a great job. Thank you.